What's up, Zach Oates here, author, entrepreneur, and customer relationship guru. Welcome to Give an Ovation, growth strategies for restaurants and retailers, where we find industry leaders to share their secrets to grow your business. This podcast is sponsored by Ovation, the actionable guest feedback tool that works on or off premise and is easy, real time, and actually drives revenue. Learn more at ovationup.com. Welcome everyone to another edition of Give an Ovation. And today we have David Maloney with us. It is an honor to have you, David. Um, Really excited to to dive into some of the things that you've been talking about. And for people who may not know David Maloney, quick, quick blip on him. He's the Executive Vice President of Analytics at Aerostream. Um, He has been featured and and, uh, he's been featured in ABC News, Bloomberg, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, USA Today. Um, he is the guy, and by the way, his favorite last meal would be spaghetti. So we're talking like real classic, uh, real classic dish there. So David Maloney, it's an honor to have you on Give an Ovation. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, about what Aerostream does? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. So Aerostream is a supply chain technology company specifically directed towards the restaurant industry. And basically we provide, we digest data throughout the supply chain on behalf of restaurants to help them have visibility into their supply chain, anticipate challenges, uh, and uh, anticipate um, different um, uh, menu surges, if you, if you will. Awesome. And, and, you know, along with being featured in all these places, a recent place that you were featured, which is how we originally got connected, was on a restaurant business. You did an interview with them, and you had some really interesting stats there. Now, and, and some stats that I found personally interesting because uh, last week I went to McDonald's to get a, a number one, and they were out of number ones. Uh, they, were, they were out of beef. Um, So Wendy's, who's got the beef? Where's the beef, right? Uh, So talk to us a little bit about what are you seeing in the industry? What's happening with supply chains right now? Yeah, sure. So uh, protein production has been interrupted um, over the last several weeks, uh, primarily due to COVID and absenteeism at at plants. So uh, you kind of think of it this way, um, um, the fabrication of the meats, uh, in other words, uh, cutting them into the pieces that, that we like to have at the grocery store or the restaurants like to buy is a, a very labor intensive uh, process. And um, it also involves employees being pretty close to each other. So um, um, employees, a lot of employees haven't felt safe at work. And so they've opted not to, uh, not to come to work and that's slowed production down quite a bit. You've also had COVID um, uh, cases at plants, which has uh, caused the local authorities to come in and temporarily close that plant. Uh, and so we had uh, beef and pork production in recent weeks trending as much as 40% below year ago levels, right? So you can think that's about 40, we we're only running about 60% capacity. Um, things are improving. Um, They're definitely improving, but that has been the main driver behind the shortage of particularly beef and pork. So is it mainly around the, so, so all of the trucks, all of the transportation, not, that has continued to remain in flow, but it's mainly the, the proteins that are transported that are having the issues. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, the good news is it's not an animal shortage. Um, it's just a, a, a efficiency problem at, at the plants that they're correcting. Um, they, they made notable adjustments to help their employees be, uh, uh, be feel safer and be safer for that matter. Um, and, um, and production starting to expand. So to give you an idea, pork and pork output uh, out last week was up almost 20% from the week prior. Uh, beef output was up about 10% from the week prior. It's not where it needs to be yet. It's only about 75, 80% of capacity, but we're getting there. And it'll take several more weeks, but we're getting there. Gotcha. And, and what about poultry? Have, have you seen similar, similar happenings with poultry? Uh, similar, but not near to the extent. So, um, you know, we saw a couple weeks where production was interrupted. Um, 
you know, uh, coming into COVID, we were tracking about five, six percent above year ago levels on production. Um, since then, we've been kind of flattish. We had a couple of weeks where we were down about five percent. We've been kind of flattish, but you know, a, a tighter chicken supplies are likely coming uh, due to poor margins for producers because during April they uh, chicken prices crashed. Uh, we had multi-year lows in important restaurant items like chicken breast and chicken wings. Um, producers pulled back on future production, right? They didn't have as many eggs being set or uh, chicks being placed. Um, that's data we can get from the USDA to give us an indication of penning production levels. I mean, those have been tracking well below year ago levels, which suggests tighter supplies are coming. Not to the levels that we had of beef and pork. We don't expect shortages, but it just may mean higher prices. So when you say there's not an animal shortage, do you mean that they had excess capacity to hold more animals? And so there's basically, whereas the animals would have been processed at a certain age, you know, it's not like they can't process it a few weeks later, right? Um, sure. But that excess capacity, they still had that in the on the factories, on the farms, they had room for the excess capacity, meaning that when the employees come back, it's not like there's going to be a shortage because it's not no. like it's got a, a shelf life. Is, is that how I'm understanding this? Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, you, you want to be careful with cattle. Uh, cattle are typically placed on feed for roughly 150 days before coming to slaughter. So they're in the feedlots, right? So, um, you know, a lot of those cattle have been put because you don't want them to put on too much weight because mm. um, it can can uh, impact quality. So uh, well, I, I certainly know, David, that I've put on the COVID-19, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, haven't, haven't we all? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but anyways, they've been put, and maybe this is just advice for you and I right here, they've been put on more of a, a, a maintaining ration of feed, right? Interesting. Uh, to try to keep, but, but there is, you're right, there's a backup of hogs, there's a backup of cattle, that are going to need to come through through uh, uh, production over the next several months, and um, um, that should most likely be accompanied with lower prices, particularly for beef. So that, that's my next my next question is: Should we be looking at an increase of prices because there have been you know because it's cost more to maintain those animals, or a decrease of prices because there's going to be a surge of supply? Well. You know, to, to give some perspective, I mean, the, uh, the USDA choice box beef cutout, which is kind of an index of box beef prices um, pertinent for the restaurant industry, um, more than doubled over about three or four weeks uh, to record highs. Um, it, um, it's still, rel it's starting to come off, but it's still relatively inflated. Um, history tells us those prices aren't sustainable. So, just from that, from a demand standpoint, you would expect consumers to back off, right, at these levels, uh, retail to back off. Um, um, and then you have that, that big cattle supply that's likely coming, right? I, I think it's more likely than not that prices are lower. Gotcha. So as, as restaurants are thinking about opening back up, should they be looking at potentially needing to bump up their prices temporarily? Um, what, what types of things are you looking, would you recommend to these, to these restaurants? Well, um, it's an extremely competitive environment, right? Um, you know, I would tell you that at least so far our data shows, uh, based on the, the movement of product moving throughout our supply chain, that states that have opened dine-in, restaurants that have been in states that have opened dine-in, have seen little impact as a whole, as an organ, as an industry, um, compared to when it was just drive-through, takeout, delivery, right off premise. Uh, now, some of that's likely shifting around. Some of that may be shifting off some chains and going to some independence, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's going to remain a, a very competitive environment for restaurants um, because even though these states are opening dine-in. Uh, you know, what really is the key here is the return of the consumer. And yeah. what we've seen so far is that consumer is very cautious. Right. Yeah. I, I, you know, just recently seen that uh, it's, it's about 60%, over 60% of consumers have concerns about going out. It's, and 55% uh, said that they have high concerns about mm -hmm. eating out. 
And as we're kind of as, as restaurants are starting to open back up last week, I went to lunch for the first time uh, at a, you know, at a restaurant and it was bizarre. I mean, there were three tables with people at it in this huge restaurant and mm-hmm. it was a lunch, lunch hour. Um, but, and so, yeah, I think that as, as consumers come back, they're going to come back with a, uh, a soft foot, so to speak. They're going to be hesitant to just, they're not going to be running into the, the stores. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a great approach to, to kind of take that cautiously, but as they're opening back up and as these, you know, as food prices, um, have, have gone up, what do you recommend? Do do you recommend, you know, is is it better to, to buy a little bit less, um, and run out as opposed to having a surplus, uh, with meat this expensive? Um, do you believe that it's going to dip, you know, as the prices come down, is that something that we should be waiting for, for the next few months? Or is that something that's going to be a pretty rapid decline just as it was a rapid incline? Yeah, so I, I think we're, we're going to see a pretty rapid decline or continue to see a pretty rapid decline. It may take several weeks before prices normalize, uh, but um, I, I do think we're going to see a pretty rapid decline. I, I, I would say that, that depending on the, the restaurant, it's all about their culture of risk, right? Mm-hmm. What, is it, what is it worth to them to have to hold on to that beef? Can they do something else with it potentially? Or are they concerned about losing a sale because yourself goes to the restaurant and can't get, can't get their number one, right? And, you know, I, um, you know, my lean is sales are tough right now. Um, and the industry can take all you can get. So, um, you know, I think that what we always advise our clients is first and foremost, you got to secure supply. You got to make sure you have supply. Then you worry about price. Right? Gotcha. Then yep. worry about price. So I, I think that's probably a good rule of thumb. Uh, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, be, and, and, and with that supply, are there people who are having more success? Uh, you know, are there certain food distributors that are having more success with beef or is this a, a nationwide problem? Uh, well, there, there are certainly producers that have done better than others, but it definitely is a nationwide problem, right? Yeah. And so as, as you're looking at this, um, as you're looking at these trends and kind of seeing the, the pricing and is, is there anything else that might be an effect of this um, that we're not thinking about, you know, that, that people aren't necessarily preparing for on the day to day, right? Does, is there any effect that this supply chain could have on maybe some broader, broader spectrums of the, you know, of their business? Sure. I mean, if, if, if for no other reason, it can influence other produce, uh, sorry, protein prices. So for example, uh, we've seen a surge in chicken prices over the last few weeks. Um, no doubt that a big part of that is because of the shortage of other proteins and, you know, um, certain restaurants and retailers have been featuring more chicken. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think you've got to keep an, as far as the supply chain is concerned, you've got to, uh, it's, it's imperative that there's visibility throughout that supply chain uh, and that, that the information of how the consumer's doing and how the individual stores are doing, that information is passed back up the supply chain. Um, otherwise, you know, in, in April, we saw better than expected sales. The restaurant industry started to come back some, right? Now, mo- almost all of it was off, pre- well, it was all off premise. Yep. Um, but it was more than expected. And then what happened is the food service distributors who were heavy inventories in March were able to get rid of that and were short inventory all of a sudden in April, right? And the restaurants were struggling getting product. Producers who were, had pulled back on production now were playing catch up, right? So I, I think that it's, it's really important uh, to have that visibility and collaboration throughout your supply chain that you work together with your distributor and if possible, your suppliers. So um, you can all be on the same page and react to this consumer as, as, um, as uh, they come back to uh, the restaurants. I, I, I love that, especially because it's so important. One of the things that we always talk about at Ovation is the, the key to the new normal is finding out what is the new normal. 
And based on your demographics, your, you know, your geography, the legal constraints, the new normal is going to be different over the next year for you than it is for someone in some other state in some other type of restaurant. And so the only way that you could really find out how your customers feel is by asking them. And so I love that, that idea of connecting, you know, your supply chain and that customer feedback and linking that all to the same place. Um, because yeah, it's like, it, it's, it's imperative to have that supply chain. Uh, and unless it's like fitting the needs, fitting the bill of what your customers are looking for and what makes them feel safe, then what, what good is it? Right. Then you 100%. just have food that goes bad. hundred percent. That's right. So David, what, what uh, final piece of advice would you have to listeners and viewers? Well, uh, I would look, I've been in the restaurant business my whole life. Um, you don't stay in the restaurant business unless you know how to work hard and you're creative and you have grit, right? Uh, I would just tell everybody to just keep fighting the good fight. You'll be surprised how much your creativity and your grit will pull you through. I love that, man. Um, so key takeaways. One, there's been a slowdown of protein, but it's not of animals. It's of employees and efficiencies. Uh, really interesting. Two, while beef prices have surged, they're going to come down rapidly. Uh, it's not going to be a year until things normalize again with that. So that's hopeful for uh, my, you know, Dave singles. Um, three, supply chain first and then price. I think that's really important. Sometimes I see clients who go out there and try to like fight, fight, fight for price. And then it's like, well, you got the wrong supplier, you know? Um, so get that supply chain first and uh, love that. Four, visibility throughout the supply chain from, you know, getting it from, you know, the, the, the farm to the customer, making sure that you've got that, you know, that, the feedback, you got that uh, supply chain in there, um, linking the, that with the customer feedback. I think that's brilliant. And then five, uh, keep fighting. The grit and that perseverance will get us through. Um, love that. David, how do people find you or your company? Sure. So you can always go to aerostream.com uh, or I'm on LinkedIn. I post a weekly blog and, um, you know, feel free to reach out. We're, we're happy to uh, happy to chat. Well, today's ovation goes to David Maloney. Um, he is a must follow on social media. He's a uh, post phenomenal articles, very insightful, data driven. So find David Maloney. Uh, find Aerostream. David, thank you so much for coming on today. Truly appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Zach. It was a pleasure. Glad you're with us today and thank you. Thank you to the risk takers, the troublemakers, the crazies who are keeping this world clothed and fed. You're the ones who deserve an ovation. Again, this podcast was sponsored by Ovation. To see how we can help you grow your business, go to ovationup.com. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, Remember to give someone in your life an ovation today.